member of the Hot Stuff Memorial Association in Rockland. And we're at the uh, Grand Army Hall in Rockland. And we've put on this uh, display of Civil War artifacts, uh, various items. Bob? Morning, I'm Bob Borden of Abington. I also belong at Hot Surf. Uh, October 13th, we're having a benefit auction, trying to raise enough money to get loose on over these beautiful stained glass windows. Up on the second floor, all they're still in one piece. Each one of these is five by 10 feet. They've been there since 1897. The building is registered on the National Registry of Historic Places. And we'd love to have you visit sometime when we're hosting a public event. We're right behind the Rockland Credit Union on School Street. Only building in Rockland with two huge cannon on the front lawn. <laughs> All right. Uh, what we have here today is uh, uh, an e examples of uh, battlefield relics. Cannonballs, various artillery shells that were found on the battlefields, uh, bayonets, a relic, uh, revolver, it's an 1858 Remington. Uh, these are canteens that were found on the battlefield, all in relic condition. These photos in the back here are photos of the Civil War veterans from the Hanover GAR post, Memorial Day and just various uh, occasions. Uh, moving along, it's, it's more examples of uh, battlefield finds, uh, collection of bullets, and uh, along the uh, end of the table, we have a selection of various original Civil War firearms. This one is a Sharps carbine, a Spencer carbine. These two firearms were used by uh, primarily the cavalry, Union cavalry. This one here is a uh, European import from Austria. This one here is called an 1841 Mississippi. It was used by both the Union and Southern forces. And this is a model 1855 rifle musket used by the Union. This picture here is a picture of the uh, Civil War veterans from Rockland, from uh, the Grand Army Post 74, which is the uh, same hall that we represent Rock Grand Army Hall. And uh, that's pretty much what we have on display here today. <laughs> and like Bob said, if you'd ever like to get in touch with us and come and visit the hall, we'd love to have you. Oh, did you get that cheap? 
I did not make that cheap. He's just my little friend. He comes with me when I do spinning demonstrations. Yarn was really useful for a lot of things because you can take yarn, just like what I'm making here, which is what's called single ply, meaning it's just one thread. This could be used to put on a loom and weave any kind of material, or it could be taken along with another strand of yarn and twisted together so that you get a thicker, stronger yarn that's good for knitting. And then out of that yarn, you can make socks, you can make shawls, you can make hats, you can make all kinds of things. And you can even make rugs out of certain kinds of wool. Wool was the thing for most of history. That's what most of your clothes would be made out of. Nowadays, it's one of the most expensive kinds of material to buy. Mm -hmm. Because it takes so many different steps to process it from the time that it's on a sheep until it's time to do something useful with it. Okay, I think I might have a chance to come over and see. <laughs> Unfortunately, wool has gotten a very bad reputation over the years because of the chemicals that they use to clean it. And with modern chemicals, when you expose the wool fiber to the modern chemicals that they use in industry, it breaks down the fibers a little bit and it makes them very coarse and very itchy. And really, wool is not coarse or itchy at all, or at least it shouldn't be. Yep, that's exactly what it does. The way the, wo the way the wheel works is it's powered by my foot. I have a single treadle, and when my foot goes up and down, it moves this, which turns the wheel, which moves the drive band around these gears here, and it turns the bobbin, which is where my yarn ends up as it's spun. There are a lot of people who think that somehow this is going around the whole machine and that's what's actually making the yarn happen. Everything is happening right here. Can you see where my finger is? And that's called an orifice. And by going in through here and then down these, these hooks guide the yarn onto the bobbin so that it goes on evenly. And eventually, I'm hoping, this whole bobbin will be so full of yarn that I'll have to take it off and put on another one. But the twist happens right here. Well, wool was good for clothing, it was good for household textiles, blankets were made out of wool. Even today, the United States Navy still issues 100% wool blankets because they're waterproof and they're fire retardant. Really? Mm -hmm. Wool is? Wool is the wonder fiber. That's, that's what I always like to explain it as. It's one of the reasons a lot of ladies have wool aprons when they're working around a fire is because it's less likely to catch. It might smolder a little, but it won't go up and bleat with flames. Unlike cotton or silk, which will catch fire at a, a lower... And has a lower. Yes, it has a lower flash point. So yes, wool was a... Silk smells nasty when it Wool smells pretty horrible when it catches on fire, too. But it takes a lot of fire to make the... Uh, to make the wool go up. And the nice thing about this is when it breaks, as it sometimes does, you don't have to tie a knot in it, you just splice a new piece of it. I'm going to go check over there. Very good. Open. <laughs> Welcome to the U.S. Sanitary Commission. What I'd like to show you today is all the good works that the U.S. Sanitary Commission is doing for the Union Army. Right now, you're in the supply department. As you notice over here, we have the supply tent, which is also sharing space with the cook's tent because we're a little bit squeezed for space. Unfortunately, the Teamsters were a little late in their deliveries, so therefore we are still waiting for the rest of the team to catch up. We have about 20 wagons of supplies that are coming in uh, steadily all day and as of last night. As you can see, that the, te the tent and the entire area are in a, a matter of disarray which is something that's very displeasing to me because I like order. Order is, the, is actually the way that the U.S. Sanitary Commission loves to run their operations. As I said, when you come over here, you can see that we have just finished feeding the troops breakfast, and we are now proceeding to clean up because lunch will probably be upon us sooner than we can probably handle it. And you certainly wouldn't want hungry soldiers. Well, bring forth Mrs. Dupre. Mrs. Dupre happens to be a brand new member. 
to the U.S. Sanitary Commission and just arrived from the train from Boston this morning. She's in training and what she's going to do is she's going to be handling the supply tent. And I've been uh, expressing to her what her duties are going to be in order to handle the inventory, control, and supplies of the tent. I do know that Mr. Craig also has been uh, reading up you know, with your job description on what is expected to you when you visit the Boston office. Well, certainly. Tell you can tell me what it is that you uh, you was instructed by the main office. Just those little things, and also, I'll also, you know, um, help you out. Um, the men in the field need uh, supplies. The um, the war lasted longer than it was expected. So um, civilians back home, wives, mothers, sisters, all family would gather, um, they'd have sanitary fairs and they would gather supplies to send to the troops. Um, which I noticed, this was really wonderful you brought these with you. Um, we have a stock inventory of items that would be needed and arm slings for people who Arm slings would be an example of something that would be needed in the field because um, there were so many injured men. And uh, uh, right down to um, cotton mattresses, coats, um, a housewife. That is a sewing kit. It's not what you think. So um, pillows, pillowcases, just everything that somebody would need to be more comfortable. Um, we also uh, collect food. Um, because they were uh, needing that, obviously. Um, oh, well, actually, you're doing very well. Uh, just so, I'm just going to show the gentleman who's visiting. I want to show the gentleman who's visiting with us today some of the good things that the people have been going into their pantries and their personal stores and donating canned goods for the soldiers because as we know the canning is best the preservation for food stuff. They've also been donating blankets, quilts, clothing. We're especially in desperate need of socks. You have no idea how fast a soldier will wear out a pair. And also we inventory everything and we make sure that it goes where it's needed. Instead of certain ladies, they're dressing boxes to go to a specific unit, especially the one that left their hometown, like the 12th Massachusetts left Abington. We're desperately trying to reach out to the ladies from the ladies' aid societies and the local churches that they must just send everything to the Central Depot over on West Street in Boston. We will inventory, catalog, and also ship out where the supplies are needed because out in the field they send word socks are needed or shirts. And wouldn't you rather have it go to the soldier that needed the supply rather than just have it go to someone who already has half a dozen shirts but is in desperate need of socks or would like a pair of mittens? So we make sure that the needs of the soldiers are properly met. And of course, like I said too, we also happen to be visiting who has been helping us out, even though this is way below her occupation, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell. And uh, doctor, would you like to speak to the gentleman while I take over? And this I isn't quite surgery, let me tell you. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, and the, I, I portray the first woman American doctor, and the first woman doctor that was on the um, British, thing, the British Registry of Medicine. She graduated from Geneva College in 1849, and it was, as you can imagine, a struggle for her to get through college. She was born in Bristol, England, though, and uh, came over here as a young lady. And as I say, she was determined to be a doctor. And she, after she got through this part of her life, she went back to France to uh, further her education and was taking care of a little baby that had an infected eye and the pus from the baby's eye went into hers and as a result she was blinded in one eye so she never realized her ambition of being a surgeon. Um, she later she opened up some schools, she knew Florence Nightingale opened up a school in, in Britain. Uh, she came back here and she had the infirmary in New York which took care of women and children. She was more uh, into the preventive medicine the cleanliness, the good diet. They visited their patients, 
and she was asked to also with the, UNIS the uh, Sanitary Commission to be uh, set the standards for the nurses. Her standards differed from those of Dorothea Dix. She wanted her nurses to be more professional, more knowledgeable, and actually into the art and science of nursing, whereas Dorothea Dix leaned the other way to the handmaiden, to the doctor kind of idea. So they did choose Dorothea Dix over um, Dr. Blackwell, but she was more than a remarkable family. Uh, she did die in the 20th century. She went back to England, but she did die in the 20th century, uh, 1913. I, I'm not sure when the day, but very remarkable woman, and um, I hope I do her justice. Coming into the 21st century, I have a what I call a delightful tale to impart to everyone. When we started this encampment, it was our idea, uh, Robin and myself, to uh, have a, a, a tent dedicated to those brave soldiers that died in the Civil War that came from Abington. We both decided that we should get a recording together, and it was decided a CD. If you go down to the tent here near the gate, you'll hear it. The CD is continually playing each name of each soldier that died, so each one can be remembered that we know the names of. I asked my son, Tom McDonald, who does some theater work in Plymouth, to do the recording. He consented, and then a disaster struck. Everybody that had a burner, br a burner on their computers, the burners burned and crashed. And I want you to know that Russ and Ann from East Bridgewater Local TV turned and said, we're not going to let our sister town, Abington, sink. They recorded your CD and they were happy to do it. They were so pleased. And I want to say thank you to my son Tom, who his birthday was yesterday. And I want to say thank you to Russ and Ann from East Bridgewater from the local TV station there. Thanks, guys. <laughs> oh, put on the timing. Okay. <laughs> you want? Are you? You want? All right. I'm Dean Rance, and I am the uh, the blacksmith for the event. I live in Rock Village, Middleborough. I do a lot of different events. I do Rev War. I do colonial, mostly colonial, but this is a Civil War event, so here I am. And um, I have a traveling forge that would have come around with the army, fixing and repairing uh, hardware, uh, wagon parts, horseshoes, uh, cannon. Uh, hardware and whatnot. And, uh, I make all sorts of items, useful items for people, too. Right now I'm working on a little mini horseshoe. Not really a horseshoe, but everybody expects to see that. Okay. Just drawing out. I'm drawing out and marking the iron. This is really my first real Civil War event I've ever done. So. Yeah, we don't like your kind. Yeah. <laughs> you stay back in that yeah. corner. The cross, the, the cross dresser over there. <laughs> I have to tell you that uh, fire grate that you made, yeah. outstanding. Cool. I still have the one that you made what 15 years ago. Cool. I still have that one. I see your sister every other day. Yeah, she said that uh, she runs across you down there in the burrow. But uh, no, you do outstanding work, my friend. Thank you, sir. Ah, oh. we should get something for that. Oh, you got conjunctivitis. No, actually, I got a uh, sty. <laughs> sty? Swollen up three times you, you, in the normal you've size. You've been looking at the pigs again, huh? Yeah. 
It almost looks like one of those squirrel cookers. Actually, I think I, ha I thought I had one somewhere. Maybe I sold Where it. Where do you have the uh, yeah, there is a squirrel. Oh, oh really? Like 40 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I do like squirrel. Ooh, that's beautiful. Camera door. Oh, awesome. Are your items up for sale, sir? Oh, they certainly are. Is it guaranteed to bring me good luck and um, quite possibly in battle. TMJ? In ba good luck in battle. <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> as you can see, I am very <laughs> eclectic friends. <laughs> I'm a very useful man. That's why they keep me alive. Otherwise, they would have executed. They How long have you been doing this for? Uh, about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not in our, our time period in general. God, uh, God. I've known you what? Fifteen years? Twenty, twenty-five years? I don't know. I think around when I was a kid. This is what you got. What got you interested right? in it? You buy your stuff out there? Do you mind if I answer you, uh, by the way? No, you know, actually, you're making things a lot easier. <laughs> <before I mentioned, laughs> what, uh, what got you into him? He go, it? He got into me, that. actually. Uh, well, I grew up in an artistic household. My father was a carpenter, and, uh, they, and he was a handyman. And my grandfather, on my mother's side, owned a hardware store. And uh, when they went out right. of business eventually, my father took home all the stuff no one wanted. And one of the things, or two of the things, was an anvil, because hardware stores used to fix stuff. Right. And a vice. Uh oh, he's going off. So uh, that stuff sat around in the bait. My father, you know, would take it out, bend nails, you know, straighten out nails or or uh, a fender on the on the scout that he was restoring. So I thought, oh, this got to be a, a use for these things other than that. And then, or dropping it on the coyote's head. So um, then I realized, hey, I, that's how they made swords. So I went down to the junkyard, got a big bar of iron, and, and, and built out of a barbecue. I built some crazy thing that with a hair dryer, and really it with charcoal briquettes, and really didn't get it going really that well. But I got the idea. But in the meantime junior high, I took shop. They had shop back then. Where still. you could actually touch things? Where you could actually make something? Wow. They had welding, electronics welding. So mm -hmm. I did a little, I took a little welding. Made some bookends and stuff like that. But they had it. They did have a forge or an anvil at least there, but it never, looked like it never got used. It was mostly just bending and, and welding two pieces together. Zap, zap. So it started coming together. And then I kind of laid, I kind of put it aside for a little while and did other things. And then I went to Mass College of Art, majoring in unemployment, of course. Welcome to college. And um, <laughs> they had a forge there. The guy from Maine, from Haystack, Maine, came down and was doing a demo. Because I was taking a jewelry class and a welding class. And I said, this is it. This is what, so I found out where to get everything. You know, the, getting the coal was, was, was good. Now, is this, is this of your own making here, or is this yeah, what yeah. they would have had, or...? Actually, this is a copy, scaled down, of the Gunsmith's Forge from Williamsburg, um, which I saw. Which is what, 1700s? Yeah, okay. but they did use something, this kind of design they used all the way up, and through the Civil War, a little, a little different, but they did have the Cavalry Forge, it's a big, huge thing with a... Now that would have to be uh, transportable, yeah. correct? Whereas this is more I can't of a stationary. Throw this, I can throw this in my truck and I'm out of here. Right, but well, during the time my, period. My, my covered wagon. Yes. <laughs> well, during the time period, though, it looks like it'd be small enough that you'd be able to carry yeah. it in, the, uh, in a wagon to take with you to do shoes or There's or a picture. There's, there's one that looks like this on the, I think it's the Monitor Lehigh or Sogs. And they're, 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 they're working on chain or something. It's, a met, it's all metal, though, but it has rails. Same idea. But then in Peters, the siege of Petersburg, yep. and they show the same kind of thing with the box and the, and the rails going back. So they did have something like that that they used. Mostly they used the big cavalry one that had, had big wheels and a, it had like a big, huge... Uh, I know someone who made one. But you had to cook, cook it up to a caisson. Yeah, you can't really... You, you have to keep not, it... Not, not practical for here. Yeah, you have to keep it somewhere. And, <laughs> So. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. I, I, so for all these you, years that I've known you, I've never known the story behind the man. And the man behind the story. All that too. <laughs> so what do you? So what do you? Are you officially official today? Yeah, I'm uh, the camp commander of uh, the Hartsup Post. 
Oh wow! Yeah. So this is our uh, our rededication of the, the statue like hundred years later. I like a groovy shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my white one was missing a butt, and I'm like, ah, I can. So what are you, uh, Major? <laughs> Light Colonel. Strange being in this, considering yeah. last, last weekend we were down in uh, Sharpsburg for the one. Yellow. Is that what? Cavalry. It's cavalry. We were down uh, in Sharpsburg. Oh, for, for the one fiftieth. Yes. I'm still picking corn out of my boots and my clothing. Cornfield. We, we did the cornfield, and that the corn, even on horseback, the corn was still above our heads. Elephant's eye. Huh? It was amazing. It was amazing. Of course, I was on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, coat was a lighter color. I'll uh, I'll leave you to your viewing public. My viewing public. Thank you much. Are pretty too. <laughs> 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 Have a cup of tea. <laughs> 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 and they'd use the canvas as a roof over the hole. Then they'd throw branches on it, they'd build fireplaces, they'd bust these up and put in a floor, they'd make furniture, tables, off the floor, beds. When these guys went into winter camp, they were there for the winter. They yeah. weren't fighting That's a battle. That's right, no, they didn't. You're right, sure. And, and when, I imagine it kept them, the fact that it was in the ground. Yep, kept the them logs, quite warm. Them and when warm. they broke camp in the spring to resume <laughs> battle, these guys were loath to do that because they had to leave this nice warm <laughs> hole that they crawled into for the winter. Yeah. Amazing. What a life they had. Interesting. It's a, what's interesting is when you start doing this, a lot of the stuff that you get into making yourself because it's either just not available or you want to say, well, how did they do that? Yeah. So very, very self-reliant people, very little store by them. Right. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, they have a lot of skills. Just a little green. Is that the black part? I am making what they call the ash cakes. So normally what the soldiers would do would just make up a mixture of um, this cornmeal, water, and bacon fat. Mm -hmm. And they would just take it just like this and throw it right into the ashes and cook it that way. And then the soldier realized, well, if I put it in a corn husk and wrap it up, then I really don't have to worry about the ashes getting into the food. 
So I'm gonna make up a few ash cakes. I didn't use bacon fat in this recipe. So I used butter. <laughs> it works. We'll see. We'll see how it how it works out. It's pretty cool. Are they good? Honestly, I never had one. I'm going to this time. I'm definitely going to. <laughs> they look like they're interesting. I don't know. No, you don't. Yeah. What do you need more ash. These are the ash cakes. I really hope we have some tongs to be able to pull these out. Yeah. Maya, if I wrap these, do you want to find ashes to put them in to cook them in? Sure. Okay. Hey, there's no more stings. What? Yeah. Oh, uh, take it. Okay, as long as you don't add fire to the ash cakes because they will burn. Right, where do I put them? Put them in the ashes, not the oh, fire. No. You want, where's I the poker? I think it's going to go on fire. Things because of those leaves, that leaf. Yeah, I know. I saw. I'm sorry. There we go. I'm sorry. Nope, that's fine. There you go, my You know what? Once that burns down, you can set that one like right in that area right there. Some fire? Yep. Just put it right on top of the ash. Wood. I gotta go check on my starter just in case. Okay, okay, hon. I don't know why, but. <laughs> How old is he now? Five now. Yeah, he's probably a little bit old. Yeah. That's a cool yeah. gun. That's not bad. It's a Remington, six shot. What you would do, you know how these work? Would you like a brief explanation? Sure. You, ever, you know how modern guns work? They've got the cartridge with the bullet and the powder already in it? Yeah. What these work is you had to put it all together yourself. So you would take the powder in a flask and you would pour it down in the chamber. Then you would take the ball, which was the bullet, and you would set that on top. And then you would take, this is called the rammer, and you would push that in there as hard as you can and it would seat in there so the powder doesn't fall out and the ball doesn't fall out. Then you would take what's called a uh, percussion cap and you would put that here on, on this little spot right here. And what happened was when you pull the trigger back, you can look down in there and see so the, where the cap sits would be right there, and this would the hammer would fall, it would hit that, light it off, and yeah. boom, the bullet would shoot right out. <laughs> These are pretty darn good. What's it, what are you looking for? All right, come on, man. After all we've done together, you know what they're selling for now, right? You know how much I, you know how much I paid for my first one? One hundred twenty dollars. No, I paid less than that. <laughs> Is that what you want, really? Yeah, yeah. Is that what it is? 25 bucks a piece. Yeah. yeah. One of them has that, and that goes with it. Oh, you're killing me. Huh? You're killing me. Yep. And I want an extra. It doesn't take much to set up something. You want a hug, don't you? No, you. You want to want an extra 50 bucks for that. <laughs> Molly, you need a hand? Okay. Good morning, folks. This is the Big Bear Trading Company, setting up here in Abington this weekend. We're sutlers. We are uh, merchants who follow the army and sell to not only the troops in camp, but also people visiting the camps. All of our items are the kind of items that uh, both the soldiers, ladies and gentlemen, and officers will be needing during this time of the war. And even though some might call us war profiteers, it is a service that we are happy to do for the troops and for the army. Please enjoy your visit here, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. We have smoking pipes, pocket knives, large belt knives, 
St. Barbara medals for artillerymen. She's the patron saint of artillery, thunder, and lightning. Jewelry for uh, the wives of the soldiers and also for the officers' wives. We also have sterling silver. Writing, uh, writing equipment for uh, the soldiers, writing home, teeth brushes, eating utensils. Captain Brown, yeah, right in that yellow orange bucket. I think it's done. It's cooked. If I can get it out. Oops. Yes. Wait, I'll get one. Thank you, Keegan. And do you usually use this tire for warmth that night? Oh yes. Indeed. Indeed I do. Ooh. That one's kind of a fire ash cake. Do you like to eat what's inside of it already? Yeah. You don't want to eat the corn husk. I think it would be too dry and too gross. Woohoo! Pull it up like that. And this. Oops. Pull that one out. I don't know if that one's going to be cooked or not. Open it. We'll open it up and we'll find out. Could you throw it on there? Um, I still have a couple more ash cakes I need to fish out of my fire. Fish out, little fish. Fish out. Yes, this will be lunch's appetizer because I'm starving right now. This. It's done. Alright. Which one? The hot pack? Sure. It's hot right now. In that pan, is that water only? It's actually baking fat. That's what they used to um, cook with. Do all their frying in because the army issued them. I know. I know what you mean. Woo! Salt cat. Too close to the fire. All the fat that got rendered from that, they would use it for all cooking and everything. Yes, we can use these for the back of the fire. We got our fire going. Now this is like a, like maybe some type of cornmeal or it is cornmeal. Um, cornmeal was the most popular um, at the time of the Civil War. Wheat flour was actually just starting to come popular with the advent of baking powder because before then there was the only way to raise your bread was yeast. Um, so cornmeal was the number one flour that everyone across the board used. You done with the lady? Excuse me. We would just. <laughs> 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 
the whole day, but it was, oh my gosh. Are you getting nervous because you can't tie this? I am really getting frustrated, sir, because you won't allow me to. I think we need to go see the tailor and get you a new shirt. Uh -oh. Well, actually, I used to do all of his shirts, but with this said. Uh, with all of this volunteer efforts with the Sanitary Commission, I have had to actually hire the work out to others. Yes, we saw it already. Keep every needle busy. I need to talk to you afterwards. Certainly. Uh, hopefully you're interested in this. I have a very historical black silk gun of the period. Thank you, ma'am. And um, Welcome, sir. Okay, would you please go and see Mr. Rocha? Mr. Rocha, he's he's running the office. He can certainly use the help. Okay. Thank you. Gaggling right now. Yeah, gaggling. Gaggling. What do we call a gaggle? I mean, it's officially a gaggle. Yeah. We think we need to make something out of this. We'll just gaggle. Oh, right. stock because oh, I was freezing but I did make a climb on uh, Mount Washington I, I wasn't um, as tightly corseted as I was and my dress wasn't as ornate as this but I did yes well there is a carriage there but no I, I climbed up Oh, I was younger than <laughs> And of course, climbing around in hoop is, is an art. <laughs> I took the carriage down. <laughs> <laughs> Although the the uh, brakes and the um, were smelling quite hot. Hmm. Um, my sons have two goats. Get away in the get away. Horses, of course. There were some cats that adopted us. There was we have uh, Fido, which we left in Springfield. He's old and didn't think he would be agreeable. And the senators, <laughs> sometimes Taddy will go through the executive mansion with the goats uh, tied to chairs and running through and running in and disturbing all of the judges. And Mr. Lincoln thinks it's the funniest thing. The senators do not. <laughs> Okay, good. If the golf cart comes, I'll go with you on that one too. So I don't want to say it, he knows how because he's throwing you could just mix young men just, just keeps on expending them. He will win this war, but at a great sacrifice. 
I'm sorry. Well, Mr. Lincoln um, actually paid for the substitute. Uh, he wasn't called up, but he has among some of the businessmen who paid for the substitutes to go in, and um, the money obviously would be sent to their families. So. <laughs> very common. Yes. Very common. It's a very common. In fact, some men sign up, get their their um, reward for that, and then go and sign up at another year. So now they have said that once you sign up, you will get it as you, at the end. Well, you may receive it or not. Right. I was just thinking that. But your families will get that. So it, it's just as I said before, all of us are in this war effort together. The men fighting, but us behind the scenes, working to help support our troops. They are not alone. You know, as the, the Sanitation Commission, the Christian Commission, all of you that have made quilts. I can tell you how a quilt actually saved a soldier's life, and this is a true story. This soldier was in the hospital, I know because I saw it when I was there, and the surgeon said he would die. His wounds, because he could certainly heal from it. But there is a lot to healing, and he must have given up. So then one of the women from the Christian uh, Sanitation Commission took a quilt and put it on him, something bright, something cherry, nothing was attracting his attention. Suddenly the next day, the man was better. And the next day, he was better still. And he, something in the quilt had caught his eye. What it was turned out to be that his wife had made that quilt. And you know, a lot of them will sign it and send little messages of support and hope. The men from his, the women from his town had all gotten together and made that quilt. That quilt saved his life because he then got up and returned to the army when he was a dead man. So whatever you do, when you make the quilts, when you make the socks and send those little notes to them, it means the world to them. And that's true. In fact, I even know a young girl up in Maine, she knit some socks and said, uh, the note was, Dear Soldier, I've learned how to knit to, knit to make you these socks, and I, I have protection in them. Every thought I have of you was to you return home. By the way, I'm 19 years old, I have blonde hair, blue eyes, and my name is Kitty D. P.S. If you are fortunate enough to have a wife, pass these to a soldier who doesn't. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. A lot of people do that? Oh, yes. Yes, there's been marriages. There have been long-term relationships developed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you never know what you make and what you send out to the soldiers. You never know the impact it has. Wow. Life is fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. I gotta take a picture of this. Can I have some my tea? Oh, me too. Cheese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You did a fabulous job. You're very kind. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lincoln. You're very kind. Thank you. Are you going to be here tomorrow? Uh, no, my dear. I have a previous engagement. I would love to be. Thank you so much, Mrs. Lincoln. We listen to the women and we will keep us up. We're going to work on that. Yes, we are. <laughs> I'm
Why do you the front doors here? Yeah, yeah that's, so nice. well, that's why we like you guys. Right? Because you guys, but the stuff you guys have. <laughs> yeah. 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 And also, 20 seconds is a repeat from this shit. What? I know you. How are you? You know, I, I used to take her, when I came to this country, I used to take care of this old Alzheimer woman. You know? Lasagna woman? Yeah. Did she make good lasagna? <laughs> or bad one. And she was sitting in front of me and say, Hi. Hi. They say, Hi. Hi. How are you? And then, I'm fine. And what is your name? Ah, such and such. Mike, whatever. Then she looks at me and says, Hi! <laughs> How are you? <laughs> and what is your name? And it goes like this. And today she's your wife. Oh, she's there. <laughs> she's you can only take her so long. For 25 yeah? years. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. I like your guns. Just for a little timeline example, from the beginning of the 1800s right up until the end of the 1800s. Yes. Yeah, it's about 1812. What is this? About 1812, Flatline. No, U.S. It's Philadelphia. It does look a little bit like it. Contract made in Philadelphia. Model 1812. No, this is this is 63 model, right? 63 Colt. And then the uh, the trap door. 71. Uh, yeah, ah, could I, could I, this one? I have one of these at home. Yeah, 1860. Uh, Zoning here? Uh, that one is, um, Ames. Ames. Ooh. For some reason it has an awful stink to it. I don't know if it was put away after they stabbed somebody. It's been rotting there. <laughs> I should have brought my, uh, I have mine, but it's German model, imported to the U.S. Civil War, but I don't have scout. Well, you can't have mine. I have the one. 64 U.S. Ames. Mine says Zoningen, but it has a construction mark here and somewhere else. That's the... Oh, I'm sorry. This is... I forgot. Wait a minute. This is uh, regular soldier. This is not wrist break. Yes, the wrist break was 1840 or so. Mine is 1840. Yeah, okay, yep, they did make them over there. Oh, 60 more. The wrist break was like 1840. This is like 1860. They almost look like but they sort of small. They do. And this wrist break is straight. So we're hand quilting it. This, you can see on the inside oh, yeah. of that one and inside of that one. We only have, I think there's three of them done. One of them, anyways, there's another one somewhere. So. so we haven't gotten that far, so I think it's going to take us a couple of years, but uh, just something to kind of keep all the civilians together. I guess, yeah. Make it kind of a social thing. So. Yeah, yeah, very nice. But, but I'll be back tomorrow. Was quilting big in the Civil War? Very. They use fabric for everything. If they had a, a day dress, they were for day dress. When the day dress got older or out of style, whenever they changed it for a work dress, okay. when it was no longer a work dress, they cut it up and make it into clothes. Mm -hmm. Kids' clothing. Yeah. Whatever they did, they didn't throw anything right. away. They just reused it. So. Right. so a lot of times they say that the quilts got really, really thin, and that's because the fabric had been for six lives before yeah. they did. You know, so. Huh. And then you just back it onto. Yep, I just put some cotton batting yeah. and then I put on each muslin on the back, which a lot of them were. Mm -hmm. um, 
<laughs> Even the really nice one I have in my bed, I do the muslin because it's like you're never going to flip it over. Right. It's the front you right. want to see, right. you know, kind of thing. So it looks beautiful. Yeah, it, the colors are just gorgeous. They wrote this with like a fabric pen. That yeah, it's a fabric finish. pen. So they must have used some type of an Indian ink back then because they wrote on them. And, it, and some type of ink that wouldn't run. Right. Because they wrote on them. So and they weren't, I mean, they embroidered some of them, but you have to do a whole phrase like that in embroidery. That's like, yeah, so. Very nice. Yeah, and so then these two, two in the front are done by um, machine put together, but there's no like free motion or stippling or anything on it. It's all, it's stitching the dish, which I would have done. Yeah. And <coughs> my daughter and I started the, the quote shop, she's Sarah May. Oh. And um, last year we had 13. But we sold 11, and there's only two we had left. But I just brought mine because mm -hmm. for display purposes. Right. But yep, those are all machine, yeah, machine done. Huh. So. And yeah. you, only yeah. crazily once every blue moon do you do one by. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. And so do you live in the? You must live in. Yeah, I live in Hanson. I live in Hanson. Okay. Fourteen minutes away. Okay. <laughs> With no truck. <laughs> well, I figured if I leave at eight. Then, okay, and the longest I'm home before six is ten hours. He's only two years old, so he's good. Yeah, he's got good kidneys. <laughs> so, yeah, we're hoping. He's a sweet. <laughs> well, thank you. Jackson. We um, adopted him after Andrew, or when well, we adopted him, he came from Mississippi. So. Oh, okay, yeah. Mississippi. <laughs> and it just fits. Yep. Well, thank you. And that's how you soak a fire. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you about all the good work. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the U.S. Sanitary Commission. We happen to be the forerunner of the present day Red Cross, and we were enacted into being by President Lincoln on June 9th of 1861 after much prodding. It turns out that, um, let's see, you're going to have to cut that. <laughs> Dr. Reverend Henry Bellows happened to had request Lincoln that he would enact a group that could, oh God, you're going to have to start over again. You better cut that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dr. Reverend Henry Bellows went to Washington to see Lincoln, and he was requesting that they enact a civilian organization to oversee the Army's operations to help supplement, but to never to supplant their efforts. Because of the Crimean War, they learned a lot of things about sanitary conditions and also by cleaning up the camps that you had fewer patient deaths. They wanted to make sure that they superseded this in the Civil War before too many patient deaths happened from disease. As it stood before, one soldier would die of bullet wounds to every two soldiers that died of disease. They wanted to definitely make sure that those numbers were you know, changed back the other way. What we have here is the operations of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, and we have three different major departments. We have soldiers relief, special relief, and we have, um, let's see, soldiers relief? I can't think. <laughs> You're distracting me. Um, we have soldiers relief, special relief, and we also have the medical hospital. The soldiers relief will take care of anything to do with hospitalization of a soldier and also getting them boarding, getting the passes back, to the military camps and also giving them train tickets back to home if they didn't have any money. The uh, special relief, which one was I on now? Bill, you're going to have to scratch the whole relief. thing and start over. I'm serious. Special relief. Uh, I can see him. That's what the problem is. The commission. Is this gentleman right here. Does anybody recognize who he is? Ever seen him before? His name is Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe. He was the founder, founder of the Perkins Institute of the Blind, and he believed that unsighted people could be taught the same as sighted people, and he even developed an early system of Braille that did not catch on. Actually, Braille was invented afterward, and now that's what unsighted people use to be able to read. He used to take extensive tours of Europe with his patients, 
and teach was teaching at other locations around Europe and showing what he was able to accomplish. So he was a philanthropist, he was a medical doctor, and he was quite brilliant. He was also a star supporter of John Brown, which is also a very important connection to today being in Island Grove. He knew and had listened to our, you know, the great, the great abolitionist. Oh my gosh, it's just making me, my heart all a flutter. William Lloyd Garrison. I'm so sorry. It's just that I've been to a few anti-slavery rallies and they're quite moving. He was a staunch supporter also of John Brown and helped to fund as one of the secret six or the secret funders to John Brown's raid at Harper Ferry, which we know how that ended up. Robert E. Lee was actually the soldier from the army, the Union Army, who actually stopped that rebellion before it really ever got started. But anyway, he is now here as the president of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, and we'll report directly to him. But somebody may also know something about his wife. She was listening one day to the camp songs being sung, and she heard John Brown's body. She thought the lyrics were very somber. She went home and she penned the lyrics that we know today as Battle Hymn of the Republic. His wife is Julia Ward Howe. So that explains our illustrious president. The gentleman in the corner is Governor Andrew. He was the one who helped, actually, along with Henry Wilson, to raise the Massachusetts 22nd Volunteer Infantry, which is also further up the camp. They're in camps today. We just always want to honor our beloved governor because he's done so many nice works for the Commonwealth. Now, right here, I have another little interesting object. You notice my eagle on the heraldic shield. Actually, this is Old Abe. Old Abe was the mascot to the 8th Wisconsin Regiment. And you're probably wondering, why do I want to talk about an eagle from the 8th Wisconsin Regiment being in Massachusetts and what possible connection could all that have with the United States Sanitary Commission? Well, there is a connection. The 8th Wisconsin Regiment was given this eagle by an Indian scout. This eagle was carried into battles and through parades and has gained such glory through the newspapers where you'd hear such things as being printed as, Old Abe wins again. Old Abe helps to win another battle. Union glory and old Abe. Well, naturally, this made great reading for the circulation of the new Union newspapers, but Confederates also read Union newspapers. They learned to hate this bird and everything it stood for and also its popularity. So what they did was they started a campaign against old Abe. When people heard of them, some of the people call them that dirty crow or that Yankee buzzard. This is the symbol of our nation, the bald eagle. Well, it turns out that old Abe one time had a price put on his head by General Price of the Confederacy. He told his men, I'd rather have that bird than an entire regiment of soldiers. So at the Battle of Shiloh, when they encountered the 8th Wisconsin Regiment, some of the soldiers reported the strangest thing. They said the Union, the Union soldiers weren't even being fired at by the Confederates. He says all of a sudden all of their rifles were aimed at the sky, shooting at something. They had no idea. Actually what they were doing is they were shooting at old Abe. The tether that had tethered him to his pole was severed during the battle and the eagle was flying above and then landed in the trees and was squawking commands right along with the commander until the battle was over. So Shiloh was a success for the Union at a great and deadly cost. But our glorious eagle was also intact. Abe survived the entire war. Now Mr. Sewell, who was over in the Midwestern Sanitary Commission, because we are a nationwide organization, you're only speaking to the members of the Boston branch, and we only handle the donations that come through New England. He decided that, wouldn't it be great that the children who have been so interested in old Abe actually become very instrumental and very active in raising money for the soldiers and sailors for the Great Central Fair. So what he did was he created cards, and this is a copy of the cards that were distributed. Children would buy a dozen of them and then return, sell them to their friends and to family to help raise money. They did so. If these children decided to enter into this agreement with Mr. Sewell, they ended up as members of the Army of the American Eagle. If you sold a dollar's worth of these cards, you could become a corporal. If you sold $30 worth, you could be a major. If you raised $400, you would be a brigadier general. There were some children who indeed raised in excess of $400. Some of these children went to the Central Fair and were issued gold, silver, and bronze coins for their efforts as commemorative medals. 
These children raised $16,000 in Civil War period money. Inflation calculators, we brought up that figure to something more meaningful to your ears, $322,000 in today's money, all done by children. So if anyone ever tells you, you're too young, you're too small, wait till you're older, you remember what the children in the Civil War did for the soldiers and sailors of this great union and for old age. And then you'll know that you're just as important as anyone else, and that yes, your efforts are very much needed and appreciated. Also, too, I'd like to show you, we have a picture in the back corner of the tent, and that's a picture of Boston, and that photograph was taken in 1860. Can anybody tell me how that photograph was possibly taken, especially at the angle? Does anybody have an idea? Camera on old age. I'm sorry? I think, you know, old age wasn't able to lift, especially those old period cameras. But does anybody have an idea of how they could have possibly taken a picture like that from that angle back in 1860? Want to venture a guess? Okay, I can let you have it if you... All right, a weather balloon. Actually, a balloon. And she was called Queen of the Air. And they took the photograph from, from the air. Unfortunately, Queen of the Air was not in service for very long. She fell into the Atlantic in 1861 and was not recovered. Though they said nothing of the pilot, they just said the balloon went down. And I really don't think that the Coast Guard was really in operation back then. And over here we have members of the U.S. Sanitary Commission from the Boston branch. And that just about concludes over here. If anybody is interested in partaking in helping the union effort, we are having any of the young hands who'd like to stitch some of the cloth. This is reproduction cloth that's used to produce the Union soldiers' trousers. This is called Sky Blue Kersey. It uses half the amount of dye that the general Union Blue that you see right here. This is, did anybody find out what this is? This is called a forage cap or a bummer. The reason why they call it that is because when the men used to go foraging, they used to put all their rations and everything that they could find in here. You were allowed when you were on the march to actually get a ration in your cap. If you happen to raid a chicken coop or whatever, sometimes the commander would look the other way. <laughs> so that's what they used to use. And there's a reason why it was designed that way. Although sometimes the articles that we wear sometimes do look very odd or funny. They're actually, it's a practical ap application to a lot of them, including the front pocket and the coats of the fatigue blouse. Now I know it's a blouse probably sounds different to you and it looks more like a coat, but we have a kidney shaped pocket in the front and again too it's for keeping all the extra things that you wanted to keep inside. And this particular soldier seems to have taken to the spirits. I'm definitely going to have to let the inspector know and also the chaplain. I think that we have a scalding ceremony in store for us tomorrow at church. Well, anyway, that just about concludes. If you have any questions, that just about takes care of the office over here. We can, you can also visit the Union Volunteer Hospital, which is in the next tent. We have the Soldiers Repose and then the actual camp. And if you happen to see anybody drinking or gambling or doing anything, well, we're supposed to be after and make sure that the, uh, the hygiene, the moral hygiene, as well as the personal hygiene of the soldiers is adhered to. And we need to know. So if you smell liquor on anyone's breath, you come back and you tell me. <laughs> the devil's for We will. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Debbie. There's a lot of lanterns over up in the uh, gallery. In the middle of a picture, I think.
Sorry, didn't see him. <laughs> Welcome to Island Grove. You saw where the train was when we turned? Yeah. The people just came right up the train. Turn around and show off. Rolled on the sides and a bun in the back, which is a very nice daytime hairstyle for a lady who has to do things around the house. Thank you. And this is my creation that I did on Debbie. All right, and I'm going to do this. And this one's mine. Miss Molly did this on me. We have a braid and a bun. So there are variations with. There are variations within the style. Would you like to show off your hairdo? Oh, that's a magnificent beard. <laughs> Sounded like. And then you try, and then you say, I'm going to set it up at home and fix it right there. Really? No. <laughs> All right, I think the end needs to sand it a little bit, and then I lost the green
Mom! What? It's not there. <laughs> and he was hanging upside down, he died. Mm -hmm. he took him out. But ever since then, we haven't seen any owls in there, so maybe they all took a powder after that, you know? This is the only time you get away from the wife, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always said that. There's a reason for these guys doing this. <laughs> hey, I've, I've offered to take my wife many times, and she yeah. looks at me and says, no. And the That's is, your idea of fun. My idea of camping yeah. is running water on clean sheets. Yeah. <laughs> the trouble is, if you take them, they always end up coming back. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Dirty in this beautiful pack. Spoken like a real doctor. You better believe it. I hope it's shiny. Right. Well, at least we're in good spirits, crew. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what died in the pool last night? Strawberries? You don't want to know. See after that. <laughs> I have more at home somewhere. Okay. Throw that other one in there. <laughs> yeah. Is this, who's, yeah um, kind of, whose Dutch oven is this? Don't know. We need a morning it's, dish. It's a mis mismatch anyway. Yeah. It's a legless one with a like lid. A morning dish call there. Really wasn't Dry it out before it gets all rusty. Um, Maybe the fire pit. I'll get that. Yeah. yeah. Can you move this crazy? I'm in a minute. I'm just going to rearrange the so that we can... I'm going to have to take this. Yeah, I'm going to move you closer. 
Oh my god, I did that with a golf lesson once. Oh my god. Needless to say, I don't, I don't play golf. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like as I said, I'm going to pull the field here. I could ask the best if I need to take me a fire field over there and I'll have to figure out a place. Carolyn, do you know where your blowpipe went? It should be over there. I saw it over there. It was over there earlier, now I can't find it. I lost. Uh, Outcast, did you, uh, did you uh, show for sick call this morning? No. We want to, well, I want, I'm sorry, but the doctor needs to check that eye before you're known as and Dead Eye Dupre. And over it. Woo! It's going to be known as Dead Eye Dupre in Oh Kansas. my gosh, look at the water that just came down off of that. Oh my goodness. Did you oh. see, did you see the um, flood? Oh no. <laughs> the love doing that. No, you know, you just kind of, uh, Nope, that you know, you're gonna, if you do that, like, it's going to be pole. dripping on the... It's, it's, it's already old. It's, it's, it's all the pole. It's already all done. 105, that's not bad at all. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, I just want to stand on the side of it. I don't know what <laughs> We're all freezing. Oh, yeah, see the crowd that stands. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't. You wouldn't do that, would oh, you? Get out of here! You wouldn't do that to us. I know. Used to work for the registry, right? <laughs>
Arch, which yesterday I think went brilliantly, and thank you all for attending. Now we're going to proceed with the fashion show, and I'm going to start with my military personnel because, as you know, duty calls. I'd like to bring forth Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell. <laughs> Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell is wearing actually a uniform that was concocted by herself. There was no definite military uniform for female doctors, and there were very few female doctors who served during the American Civil War. So what she did is we just took a modified man's bra coat and turned it into something a little bit more feminine. That's why the skirted coat is pleated, rather than just straight down as a man's bra coat would be. And she's wearing uniform breeches, just as a gentleman would have. She modeled this uniform after one that Dr. Mary Walker wore during the Civil War. And of course, it's made completely of wool as the surgeon's uniforms were of the day. And it is trimmed in metallic lace. The complete uniform was researched and also drafted from period patterns and tailor's manuals to ensure that the cut fit and construction reflected those of the American Civil War. You are not looking at a costume. You are looking at a historical garment. The front buttons on the uniform are copies, they're brass buttons that were used for the Union military. And she's wearing, of course, suitable sho walking shoes on the bottom because you have to say, too, high heels just won't do out on a battlefield. <laughs> you, really you can't, avoid, you can't avoid the horse. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Doctor. All right, I'm dressed more, not for battle, but more for camp, a little more relaxed. Uh, normally I'd have uh, a frock coat, the military fatigue coat, about this long. Uh, and uh, as you'll see, Private Andrade over here, who's a musician, he's wearing a winter uniform, winter coat. Uh, but we both are wearing Brogan's or Jefferson boots. These were designed by Thomas Jefferson. It's a square-toed shoe. It, actually, when you first wear them, it doesn't matter what foot. Once they break in, they break in left and right. Uh, these are held together with uh, wooden pegs, no nails. And then on the, on the heel here, I have a, a heel plate. It's like a horseshoe. It keeps it from wearing out. Uh, wool pants, uh, cotton underpants that come full length. Keep the wool from chafing you. Uh, wool socks. Uh, the vest and the shirt would be sent from home. Uh, uh, vests were not issued to soldiers but Victorian gentlemen always wore vests. So often they would get them sent from home or have them custom made for themselves. The shirts, uh, the issue shirts would wear out very quickly. So again, you know, mom or your sister, your wife or whatever would send you stuff from home. So uh, a bit more feminine than gentlemen of this day and age actually wear, but uh, it's quite appropriate for the day. Um, I also am wearing a forage cap. This was the issue hat. Uh, sometimes you see officers wearing a slightly different hat uh, called a kepi, uh, which was a little more fashionable. That was something they had to have made. This was issued. The reason they call it a forage cap is legally a Union soldier was allowed to supplement their rations with whatever food stuff they could procure or steal or forage uh, for one day. So they could go into a farmhouse down south and raid the larder. Uh, the eggs, whatever they could find, and fill that cap, and that was legal, uh, and hence the name forage cap. Uh, the red insignia on the top uh, was later in the war. Uh, General chewed out some soldiers for not being in the right position at the right time. It turned out they weren't his men. So after that, he ordered the, all his men to wear an insignia on their hat, and the army adopted that. 
so this insignia is for the Fifth Corps, which the 22nd Massachusetts is a part of. Uh, you'd often see they would have put a number 22 and a letter D like Nick here has. Uh, that would identify the actual unit and company that you belong to. So you wouldn't get chewed out by the wrong officer. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty much it. brought forth Private Dupre, we would like you to see the woman who stands behind the man. May I present to you Mrs. Michelle Genero Dupre. As you notice that Mrs. Dupre is wearing an outfit that is quite different from my own. This is known as a state of undress called a sack and a petticoat. There are several different modified versions of this design in which there is a jacket-like bodice it is worn with a separate skirt. The nice thing is, is that you're able to work in this outfit as well as when you pop on a hoop, you could actually go to market in it. Very casual style, very relaxed style, and it's also great for also taking in visitors and also wearing the home. She's wearing beneath her sack, and the sack is spelled S-A-C-Q-U-E, it is French. This is not like a potato sack. That it's French, it's refined, it's fashionable. Okay, she's also wearing a hoop petticoat. There were two different ver versions of the hoop. And one was inside of a, a, a petticoat, the other ones were wired cage, which we'll show you one of those very soon. And also she is wearing her privacy petticoat. Unfortunately for most women, when you're descending a staircase and there are unscrupulous men stationed at the bottom, they try to glance your ankle and sometimes even up to your kneecaps. <laughs> Privacy ladies is of the utmost important as well as your reputation. <laughs> but she's going to take a walk around. The outfit is also trimmed in tape lace in a common design that was also published in a lot of the ladies magazines. And this is a little bit of a dressy dress that allows her to go to market. She's going to take a little walk around there. Also, Mrs. Dupre has given her services to the United States Sanitary Commission and she's wearing her patriotic ribbon to show her allegiance to the Sanitary Commission. These were copied from actual patriotic ribbons that were produced in the early years of the war. Many of them said, I am for the Union, uh, Lincoln and Liberty. Such, uh, such messages that all done by the local printing offices in Boston, Philadelphia, New York. And we just modified ours for the United States Sanitary Commission, and she wears that, so everyone knows what she does with her with her daylight time. Oh, Mrs. Okay, Mrs. Dupre is wearing a different type of uh, shoe than you saw Dr. Blackwell wear. Laced up in the front, nice solid heel, which is great for walking. And I think you glimpsed those stockings. How shocking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to start losing where I'm supposed to be here. A shocking lot. Now, just remember, ladies, if the society newspapers get a hold of this one, this woman's reputation is going to be on the line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they also have wooden pegs on the heels, I was told, which is something that they're doing in addition to a stitched shoes. They also still make uh, shoes with wooden pegs. Both the Union Brogans and uh, also uh, civilian wear. You can see the pegs on the bottom. They're quite nice. Do you like the fish? Oh, I guess I know you've been doing your pin money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Craig.
this dress here is made from a pattern that was specifically made to be worn as a wrapper. Many women did to stretch their wardrobes, took old dresses, cut away the fronts, took away all the worn parts, faced it with other cloth, and then turned old dresses into wrappers. You can see also when Miss Molly comes walking forward that she has a waist that is gauged. Gauging is a kind of gathering. It will look almost on turned on its side like ribbon candy. It has a definite hill and a valley to it. And then it is whip stitched onto the waistband of the garment. This helps give it a definite hook and give it a nice defining line. She also Oh, and also, if Miss Molly chooses, she can also tighten it up because there is a drawstring mechanism inside which will allow her to tighten up and make this a more fitted looking garment instead of a nice flowing robe. So as you can see the difference. This can be worn with or without a very small hoop. <coughs> Alright, oh yes, yes actually, she has a mystery on, no, not so petty. No. We have a mystery going on under that, she's going to show you on the wall. that they don't know what they are, that they have never seen one, and we would like to do the same. This here is the first garment that a lady would put on at the beginning of the day, and it is called a chemise. The styling would be like that of an oversized t-shirt. It's three-quarter length, and this one is designed to fall off the shoulders. Very, very small sleeve to give protection to the dress that is being worn. The ideal in the 19th century is that adults get dirty from the inside out. So therefore you do everything that you can to protect your clothing to get more wear and use out of them. Also it helps also to define the foundation garments and underlying parts of the wardrobe itself. Everything here would make sure, except for maybe the neck area, this would be ideal also for a ball gown or dinner dress, that the inside dress is protected. Silks and wools cannot be sent to the dry cleaners as there is no such entity. Things have to be spot cleaned. The only fabrics that we have that can take a washing would be cotton. That's why I'm wearing a wash dress and we will get into that shortly. Now Mrs. Cody is wearing, she's actually demonstrating, a pair of drawers. Pantalets is such an old fashioned expression. Drawers are a little bit shorter, a little bit less full. And as you noticed, they have a split crotched. They have a split crotch. <laughs> and you thought Frederick so Hollywood was racing. <laughs> now there's a necessity to this split crotch. In order to be able to use the privy wearing multiple petticoats and a hoop, there is no way you're going to deal with Mother Nature's necessities without it. In order to maintain privacy, you can either tuck in your chemise or because the chemise is so full and long, you can also leave it untucked. But that's also another necessity for the privacy petticoat. Without it, if you ever tripped and fall, you want to talk, free show. There was actually, Been there. <laughs> there was actually one countess in England. She fell and rolled down a hill. It was shocking. They loved her red, scarlet, woolen. <laughs> now here's what I'm showing you is a little bit of a more rarer foundation garment. This is an original 150 year old corset. This corset is known as a skirt supporting corset. As you see from the back, it flips out with a piece of cane. So the cane will actually support the back of the dress so it keeps it from imploding. This has instead of uh, to give you instead of a split bust in the back, we have side lacing 
to give adjustment. As you can see that the original owner of this corset was not a very large lady at all. She was very small. She has an approximate waist measurement of about 25 inches. You might also find interesting, and I would like to definitely squash this one now, the fantasy and fallacy and myth of the 17-inch waist does not exist. Definitely not. A costume museum in Bath has over 200 period dresses, of which the curator measured out the waistline on each of them. The smallest was 25 inches, the largest 31. Most of them ran within the 27, 25, and 28 inch range, which just about sounds right, doesn't it? When you think that most women were about five foot, five foot one, with a waistline of that measure. So it really does not sound as terrible as you might think. So that will at least take care of that. So just think of it. A roll of toilet paper is about 17 inches in circumference. Could you actually imagine having a waist that small? When people used to go in and order a corset, they would say, I'd like a 20. A 20 with three inches of expansion, where the lacing was. You ordered a 20, but you're really a 23 or a 24. So it wasn't quite what you think. The sizing was different back then. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I know you've had, she is a tight lacer. <laughs> you guys should have seen at Fort Adams. There was this great line of women holding me as Miss Deb, God love you, was literally strapping me in. I actually am roughly a 36 inch waist. I can get down to about a 31. If I try. <laughs> and I've tried and it works and it looks great and people go how is this up here and this down there I don't understand the thing about it that people also don't understand is it's not very comfortable to tight lace so most of these women were actually slender to begin with and didn't do that um, the corset was more to give you the correct shape and, and it helped keep your back upright and, and keep the posture that you needed to really hold these gowns you know, it's it's really interesting watching women get strapped into their corsets because there's usually a big burly man or a pole or a tree or a large piece of furniture involved. <laughs> of course, I'm not a tight lacer. I'm actually, <coughs> actually able to get my own corset on. And I'm just more for support and shape than I am to ever try to look like the corset diet worked for me. <laughs> the corset diet worked for me. <laughs> So we're going to take away the undergarments and then we're going to get on to the outerwear. Oh, this is the shirt. Alright, this is a man's shirt, but we're going to wait for the men. We're going to make sure Alright, good thing. generation reenactor. I started out with Revolutionary War. I've been doing civil for almost three years. Um, I'm a sutler. Basically what I end up doing is I go around and sell people the things that the army doesn't give them and make lots of money. And I make them happy at the same time, so it all works. Um, generally I look very fancy because I have a lot of money. I can. But as of right now, due to us being in the field and with slightly smaller quarters, I'm not wearing my hoop if you haven't noticed. Yes, these are my hips. It makes it easier to maneuver around tables. It makes it easier to maneuver around tents. Um, it was a bit chilly this morning. I'm wearing a sauntop. You'll see quite a few women wearing them as it gets chillier. It's a woolen garment that wraps around your torso and meets in the back, which keeps you nice and warm. I'm also wearing white shirt sleeves, which was very well thought of because the whiter you kept your clothing, the, the wealthier you tended to be. Um, I'm wearing a Scottish plaid and it looks a little interesting being an American soil. It's actually because Queen Victoria, when she came into the beginning of her reign, decided to vacation quite a bit with her lovely husband, Prince Albert, up in Scotland quite a bit, and she brought back tartan. She, she started fashion trends. It's kind of what she did. And, and therefore, a lot of the women's clothing tried to replicate what she was making very popular. Therefore, that's what I'm wearing. Also wearing an original hair I don't know if you can see it. It is from the Civil War period. It's actually called a morning comb. Reason being is a lot of the jewelry was actually out of some shade of black or 
they called it French jet, which was glass, or Whitby jet, which was actually a plant matter that decayed into a hard shell and they carved it. Um, so by the way, if anybody after this wants to go buy something, Big Bear Trading Company, right at the top of the hill. <laughs> See y'all later. <laughs> myself and did a huge faux pas. I left the camp area with my apron shame on me. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you're in a rush and you're also in charge of all the men. Did I say hello? Anyway, this is my day dress. It is also utility fabric. It is made of cotton. In order to dress it up, I have on a collar. I've also attached sleeves, which gives it a much more dressy look. It's also double pointed in the front which will also give it a very elegant style. It helps to draw in the uh, illusion, to draw your eye into the waist. The idea of this particular point of fashion is to look like an hourglass. Wide shoulders, narrow at the waist, <coughs> wide again at the hemline. So you look like an hourglass with about 40 minutes in the wrong place. <laughs> so I thank you. elegant ladies. We are going to bring forth first Miss Erin. Miss Erin is 11 years old and she is dressing as according to her age. This is how you dressed a young girl and this was a good way to be able to tell the boys that these are children, these are not girls that you can date, they are not ready for society and hands off. Because as you know, everybody develops at a different rate and some 16 year old girls look like they're 21 and other girls look like they're still ready to play with their dolls. So if you dress them their age, this will signal society. 
that they're actually at a certain designation. Well, Miss Erin happens to have a different situation going on with her, as it is spoken that adults get dirty from the inside out. Children get dirty from the outside in. Therefore, Miss Erin wears a pinafore apron to help protect her clothes. Wash day is approximately one day a month to last three working days. One day to wash, one day to dry, and one day to iron and put it all away and wait till next month. So with that type of a schedule with most large households, you definitely made sure that the children got absolute maximum use out of their clothing and protected them as much as possible. Miss Erin would like to take a little walk around. She is wearing a hoop skirt. Yes, <laughs> hoops were fashionable to all ages. Young children actually photographed even in school pictures, even as young as first grade, wore hoop skirts. Hoop skirts were very economical. They were only 20 cents a piece for a young lady such as her. A larger hoop for an adult lady would run as much as $2. If you save your pin money, you can afford that. I just wanted to let you know. All right, Miss Erin, thank you. We're going to bring forth a point of pride, our daughter of the regiment. This is Miss Heather. Miss Heather Bursicki is the daughter of the regiment, and she has been adopted by the Massachusetts 22nd Volunteer Infantry as a sort of a mascot. She is marching during the parades as a point of pride to also show her support of the Union. The 6th Volunteer Mass Militia also from Massachusetts had a daughter of the regiment, Miss Lizzie Jones. She was the daughter of Colonel Jones. The 6th Mass, after their 90-day papers were over and the 22nd Volunteer Regiment was being raised by Henry Wilson, all those men came and re-enlisted as the 22nd Volunteer Infantry. Miss Heather is wearing an outfit that has been documented and also copied from other prime sources of other daughters of the regiment that have been, uh, that have been in the Civil War, especially with the USSC. They would dress up girls as daughters of the regiment. They would take their pictures and then sell them over at the Soldiers and Sailors Fair. You could have your portrait taken with them, or you could just buy portraits of the daughters of the regiments themselves. This outfit was copied from history. She's wearing a Garibaldi shirt on the top, which was directly copied from fashion from Giuseppe Garibaldi's troops from the Crimean War in the 1850s. It is made of cotton and it has wool sash braid trim. She is wearing a silk sash with silk fringe, a wool skirt with tape lace trim and rosette. Below it, she's wearing a hoop skirt, which again, we still want to follow the fashionable silhouette of the, arm, you know, of the fashion, whether she looks like she is quasi-army or not. On top of her head, she's wearing a scotch cap that was also copied from an actual original hat. And of course, the red, white, and blue to show the Union colors. I thank you very much, Ms. Heather. <coughs> ladies are our daughters of the regiment, but I had to break up their outfits just so that we could do the fashion show. They look quite stunning when coming down the parade route. Now we're going to bring forth Miss Holly. Miss Holly is wearing a summer sheer. Yes, it wasn't all about heavy wool dresses and cumbersome looking dresses. Miss Holly's dress is that of the most gossamer fabric you can see through it. It falls in beautiful, graceful lines and gives her the look of a sugar sponge infection. You might notice that where everybody else is wearing necklines up to their neck, everybody has a high neckline, she has her shoulders bare. Quite unusual, but she can do this during the day where an adult could not. That neckline is considered evening wear for an adult but children could wear off-the-shoulder dresses during the day and short sleeves as well, where adults are obligated into long sleeves unless they are working. Then we can pull them back and get them out of the way. This denotes that she is 14 years old according to the length of her hem. As the children grow older, the hemline starts about below the knee and gradually grows longer and longer until about the age of 16 to 18 when mother has figured that she is suitable to 
have coroners call upon her that the hemline will reach the ground signaling to the male population in general that she is fit for adult society. Right now, Miss Holly's mother is telling the boys hands off. <laughs> the hemline is still well above the ground where most 14 year olds would be wearing it. The shoulders are bared during the day. The bodice is designed in a very childlike manner. Children as young as age two will wear something almost identical and the short sleeves during the day. She has her hair dressed so appropriately and she's wearing fresh flowers in her hair. Something else where a bonneted lady would have to prescribe to in order to be considered fashionable and not a disgrace to the family, young sisters can also go without hats on their head all the time.